now back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. And welcome back to The Law Show on CL 650. We're talking about relationships, breakups, ultimately divorce with David Halkett. He's partner at Macquarie Hunter in the uh, family law department there. Uh, the perfect person to talk about this, uh, been at uh, Macquarie Hunter since 2003. Um, now, we talked, you know, about your background and, and family law and how it's different from every area of law, uh, every other area of law. But let's get into a little bit of the uh, the... the simple stuff, uh, maybe not so simple, but simple for you, like the basics of someone comes to you and they want to start the separation and ultimately a year or so from that time, they will become divorced. So mom and dad living at home, two kids, we'll paint that picture okay. in a, in a yeah. house or a, or a condo or what have you. How does that work okay. before you get to the final resolution? What do you suggest to people? Well, you know, when, when I first started practicing years ago, people could move out and live in different residences because rents weren't as high, mortgage payments weren't as high. But now the cost of living in, in the Vancouver area is really high compared to other parts of Canada. So often they have to remain in the same home. In a condo, it's, it's, it's more difficult because they're usually like two or three bedrooms and it's like maybe 1,200 square feet and you're going to fall, yeah. fall over each other. Yeah. Many houses um, in, this, in the suburbs anyway have um, rental suites where, you know, one of the spouses may move down there, but they remain separate but in the same house. So they live separate lives, but they just cannot move out of the same residence. Um, it can make it difficult for the parties if they're not getting along as amicably as it can be in, in this situation. So what... That's pretty tough to look at that person every is. day for a year or so, especially if there is no basement suite. Right? It is. And, you know, sometimes part one party will slept on the sofa for a year or in the, in the, the guest bedroom or whatever. But yeah, it's, it's difficult, you know, like the movie The War of the Roses. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not easy. So if they can get along fine and, and it's uh, to live in the same home, then they can be separate in the same home until you've sold it and figured out how to divide the asset, etc. Um, if, however, they're not getting along, you can apply for exclusive occupancy of the home by one of the parties. And usually that's an order that's made when there's children and it's impractical for the parties to live together. Um, they're not getting along. There's... So that might be a small condo, for example. Or exactly. Work, right? Or it could be if it's just not um, what they thought was going to be amicable, it just hasn't been for whatever reason. And I've had other cases where someone, one of the parties has moved out. The kids have stayed in the same home and the parties have moved out. They rented a place together um, and they just kind of live four days on, four off or however. They work it out that way. But it can be difficult the longer it goes. Now, ultimately, uh, assets are sold usually for, yeah. for the divorce. Do you ever get situations where the house is sold before the divorce just so you can split the money to go and get your own place? Yeah. Um, because you just can't look at each other. Yeah, the, often the parties, sometimes they've listed for sale before they come to see, to see me. And, and uh, they'll say, look, we, we've, li we've listed for sale, we're going to sell it, and we've agreed we're going to split the, the, the money equally. Now, there may be a reason that they shouldn't be, and you know, sometimes one party will, will take steps to ensure that doesn't happen, it doesn't get divided out. But often the parties know what they want to do with the house. And some they'll decide that they're going to uh, sell the house, split the proceeds so they can move on. Mm -hmm. Or some will just take a certain amount out of the house and put a down payment on something else that they can live in and argue over the balance. So there's, there's numerous options that... Or you could say if you had a line of credit against the house, you're going to take out $50,000 to rent an apartment for a year or whatever yeah. it costs, right? The, the, when, when the parties are willing to sit down and talk with, through lawyers uh, or with the assistance of lawyers... There's a lot, there's, you know, any end of, of uh, solutions they can come up with that'll work in the interim until they can resolve everything. Because mm -hmm. that's a tough time. That's the no man's land. Well, yeah, it's, uh, you never know what the result is going to be. You know, um, it's like crossing that Rubicon that what's going to happen down the road, who knows? And so it's important that you not take rash steps that you're going to regret, but that you do enough that in that year or year and a half and from the, the date of separation to when it's all resolved, your life can go on as smoothly as it can in the situation. Okay, now we get to the point where you're negotiating and maybe the courts are involved with this about support yep. for um, one 
spouse to the other. How is that determined? Okay. And who pays and how is it, how is there a ratio? How does it work? Okay. Well, there's a couple of different types of support. One is contractual when we, we had a prenup agreement and if we separated, I was going to pay you X dollars. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen all that, that often. There's the other two main types are what they call compensatory and non-compensatory. Compensatory means I was the spouse that stayed at home or gave up my job to move around for your job uh, or I took care of the children. We have a special needs child at home that I have to take care of so I can't work full time and I have to be compensated. Sorry to interrupt, but you must have uh, situations where someone has been out of the workforce for five or ten years to raise children and then goes back. Yeah. So are they compensated for that time they're out of the workforce? Yeah, that's the main type of compensatory Mm -hmm. maintenance. You've lost out on income during the time. Building your, building your pension. Exactly. All those things, right? Um, you've lost out on promotions. The, I, I saw a study once that said that for every year that a, a woman puts off having a child and taking her mat leave, her income grows over the time of her career exponentially. Hmm. Because you lose out on that one, say you lose on a 5% increase that year. The next time your 5% is on a lower amount instead of the higher amount. Mm-hmm. So you've lost out over the time. And that happens when you're out of the workforce for five to ten years. And sometimes it's longer. You, you know, some of them are 15 or 20 years. And so instead of being 25 to 28 and a career in front of you, you're then 45 to 48. And the skills you had 20 years ago just aren't relatable today. Mm-hmm. You know, just computers alone have changed, you know, in the last five years, let alone 20 years. So you compensate for the amount of time they're out of the workforce. They're never going to make what they would have if had they stayed in the workforce. So there's that, there's lost pension, lost promotion, and you get maintenance until you've been compensated for the loss. Mm. And um, then the second type is needs-based or non-compensatory. Oh, sorry, sorry, just the sorry. backup. So yeah. say it's calculated and we'll pick a yep. number of $100,000. Yep. So that person will pay X number of dollars per month until that $100,000 is, is paid back? Is um, that what you're saying? Not necessarily, uh, but it, it's, there's a formula that, uh, that we can get into of how to determine spousal maintenance. Mm-hmm. Um, based on the differences in the two incomes. And I'll assume for the moment there's no children. So it's one half of the difference in income for um, times the number of years you were together for like half a year to a year for each year of marriage. So say you were together 20 years and the difference in income was $50,000. Working out on, there's a computer program, works it out, tells you what the range of maintenance Mm, is. Okay. And... um, it may very well be that the court deems compensatory to be 10 years. It could be deemed to be 15 years. It just, it, it, it's very fact specific in each case. And so there is a, there is a calculation there. Yeah, there is. Okay. Yeah. And what was the, what was the next one? It's needs based. Okay. Uh, similar calculation, but that is only until the need is met. So say for example, uh, you separated and you hadn't really don't have a compensatory claim, but your income has dropped from as a family from, combine 200,000 to only 75 for yourself. There's a difference there that you have to get over while you're moving out and setting up your own, your own life, so to speak. Uh, needs-based often will end when you get, if you get into a new relationship. Does that mean married? Or common law. Hmm. Whereas compensatory can go on past that until the comp- compensation has been met. Or can you just negotiate a lump sum? You can. Um, usually the payor wants the lump sum because it's a set amount comes out of the house, say, for example, mm-hmm. is paid right then and there's no monthly spousal support. Downside of that, of course, is if the person goes out and gets a job and you wouldn't have paid spousal support, you don't get the money back and you don't get a tax deduction. Upside is you never have to worry about paying spousal support again, which is what the payor usually wants because spousal support even um, can, can be... Uh, uh, indefinite over time insofar as there's no end date. And indefinite can go on 10 years, can go on 20 years. Depending so what, on the age what of the do you typically see? Um, I see if there's an asset, the, the guy trying to work out a way to pay, and it's usually the guy who pays mm-hmm. at this time, trying to pay out the, a lump sum just to put an end to the maintenance. Uh, when I'm acting for the recipient, usually the wife, <laughs> I tend in most cases not to recommend a lump sum because you don't know what your need or your what your situation change, is going to be. Yeah. And if you spend all the money, you know, it happens a lot. You know, you meet someone new who's a charlatan, takes your money and runs with it, you have nothing. 
and there's no way to go back. No, because you, usually there's a there's a release of, of maintenance, and if you're the payer, the if you're the person who pays the lump sum, you require dismissal of the claim in court and a waiver, a written spousal waiver that says I can't come back at you for money anymore. Okay, husband and wife are getting divorced. He's a middle manager at mm-hmm. a bank. Yep. They get divorced. The spousal support is set, and then. Within six months, he ends up being the CEO of Royal mm-hmm. Bank of Canada and making millions of dollars. I'm just making yep. stuff up. But gets a much bigger job and making more money. Mm-hmm. Can the spouse go back and say, he's money bags now, I want more money? Or once it's set, it's set? No, it depends on the uh, what the agreement says. But usually the, it's all agreements and even orders are variable on a change in circumstances. Mm. And if the change in circumstances wasn't in the contemplation of the parties at the time the agreement was reached, then you could go and vary it. So in that situation... If he making more, way more yeah, money. Yeah. If he wasn't telling you I'm applying for this job and I don't know if I'm going to get it, and all of a sudden his his income triples, you probably have the right to go back to ask for more, hmm. because then he's getting the benefit, even if it's after the lifestyle is completely different. There, on the other side, there's got to be the like, when am I done? When when is yeah. this going to end? And usually, um, is this going to drag on forever? Yeah, and and usually the payer wants to he wants to set time, and often when it comes to a date of retirement. It's usually that's the time that it often will will end, you know, because you the ironic thing is that's when you typically need it more is yeah. when you're in retirement. Although if you say you've divided a pension, we'll just say there was a, a work pension you, and the only source of income after is your work pension and Canada pension plan for both parties. You can't get maintenance out of the already divided asset. Mm. So if you divided the asset already, the portion that was divided, you can't go back and say, well, you're making 10 grand out of that and I make six. So therefore give me the difference if that was what the amount was at the division. It, every, as I said, every case is fact-specific, so that's why I tell everyone who has these questions, get your legal advice because this is more of a general, obviously it's general, and each case is very, very fact-specific. Sounds fascinating. It is. I, uh, did you <laughs> ever think a lawyer, lawyer would be getting your calculator out? No, <laughs> and, and good thing we have computer programs that can make these calculations for us. All right, David Halkett is a partner of Macquarie Hunter in Surrey, uh, serving all of the greater Vancouver area. Macquarie Hunter uh, is at Central City in Surrey. It is. Did I get it right yeah. this time? That's you a did. tongue twister for me. Uh, <laughs> when we come back, we're going to go from spousal support to child support on The Law Show on CL 650. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CL 650.